Okay, hello everyone. I think we are right on time, so let's go ahead and start. Uh, my name is Piotr Zalewski. I'm currently an associate lead test automation programmer at People Can Fly. And today I'm going to talk about automating game testing in Unreal Engine. So first of all, I would like to talk briefly about what actually automated testing is. Uh, so opposed to manual testing, uh, automated tests are run through the automation tool, meaning a software that drives the test execution. Uh, it requires little to no human interaction if you set it up right. So it basically will, will run yourself eventually. Uh, depending on your settings, it will generate uh, test reports. So you can uh, just read the report when the test is through, so you don't have to generate it by hand. Also, uh, automated tests tend to be run on the machines, which, as we know, doesn't require sleeping. So basically, they can be running at any point of that day, uh, during night, uh, midnight, whatever. And due to the nature of the whole process being automated, it's quite a good solution that fits well with your continuous integration system or continuous delivery system. The question is now, uh, why would you use automated tests if, uh, if, you, if you have manual testers? Well, first of all, mm, machines tend to be faster than human, and then don't make uh, erroneous mistakes as we humans do. And uh, also, it provides us with better coverage, because uh, we can run multiple instances of the tests on multiple platforms and multiple configuration at the same time, which human cannot do. The results will be consistent because, uh, well, tests won't be changed and it will be executed every single time in the same manner. And as I stated before, if you create your reports, like the flow of creating the reports right, you'll have detailed reports on your mail, probably. Uh, another advantage is that uh, your QR resources can be shifted to the task that uh, really requ require human eye and attention to details. So while the basic tests are being run by the machine, your QA can do the stuff that machines cannot do. If you create your uh, test for the features, like your developers create those tests, it will ensure the features quality because, because if anything is broken, you will see it quite immediately. So now we are moving to the topic uh, that will um, address the types and the um, options that we have when we uh, do the testing in Unreal. Keep in mind that we are only talking today about simple and complex automated tests, uh, but Unreal have other options. Uh, there are AI tests which are specifically designed to do with the AI. We have specs with a small advanced, advanced topic and it follows behavior-driven design. And we also have functional tests, which uh, allows you to do your tests uh, using Blueprint API. So it's a good option for people who uh, are not keen into programming. So uh, I will briefly describe to you uh, what is engine automation framework in Unreal. There will be some of the code examples, but not so many. Uh, the idea here is to let you know what, what's the structure of the framework so you have better understanding how to use it. So first of all, we have a struct called F Automation Test Framework, and it's, uh, it represents your framework. It's uh, basically driving the execution of your tests. So every time you issue a test, the framework, the class will handle it. It allows you to filter tests by their types and their run context, on which I will talk a little bit later. It also is responsible for uh, concluding the test, and this includes um, interpreting test results. Uh, moreover, we have the thing called latent command that I will explain on the next slides, and it handles them. It uh, ensures they are completed, it starts them, it queues them, um, and decues them. 
Also, it have a couple of delegates that might be useful when you are writing your test. So remember the slide when I was talking about the types of the test. Uh, all of those test types are derived from one common ancestor. And this ancestor is called F automation taste base. Uh, it's an interface class which allows you to implement your tests. It provides you with common interface to run your, write your test, and each test is uh, able to use this inter interface. Uh, moreover, we have some logging methods, which are quite useful because if you compare them to regular uh, Unreal logging, they have disadvantage that uh, if you use logging from, from your test, it will write the precise line from which this uh, error or information is being logged, opposite to regular Unreal Engine logging. Also, you can filter your errors or information that you really don't need to see. You can skip those. So they won't pollute your end log. Uh, moreover, we have... Um, some unique tests that allows you for checking your assumptions. So, for instance, if you assume that some kind of pointer should be not null at this point, uh, you have helper methods to do so. The same goes for any basic type in the Unreal Engine. Most importantly, uh, this um, class um, allows you to implement the method called run test. It is uh, the most important function because without it, you, you cannot have test logic. Uh, you're supposed to put your logic of the test right here. The test, uh, this, this function returns Boolean value, which indicates if the test should be marked as failed or passed. Uh, as stated before, it's apparent for all of the test types in the Unreal Engine, and it's completely written in C++, and it's uh, because of that lightweight and content and map independent. So yeah, you don't need any content to, to write your tests. So moving on to, um, uh, to discrepancies between simple test and the complex one. Uh, there are not that many differences, actually. So the simple test requires you to only implement test logic. But if you like to implement a complex test, you have to create an override for another function, which is called get text, get tests. And in this function, you basically create the arguments that will be run for each of the simple test run instance. So a good example would be, let's say we have a project and we would like to test if every of the maps in the content folder loads in. Then in the get test, we'll iterate over those folder, gather map names, and then use those names to run the instances of run test. And a part of that, that they use a different macro, which is which only differs with a single word. There are no more differences between those two. So now a little bit of coding. So to create a simple and so-called instant automated test. Uh, instant meaning that the whole uh, logic of the test will be handled in one call when we execute our test logic. We have to do uh, at least two things. So uh, Epic suggests that, uh, well, it's not a suggestion here, but you should put your uh, test source, uh, test uh, code in the source file, meaning with the CPP extension. And the uh, rule of, of a thumb is to be, it, it's to, be to uh, suffix the name of this file with a test. So we know that this file contains the test for your functionality. So first, what you have to do is to use the Epic provided macro, which is called implement simple automation test. And this macro takes three arguments. And the meanings of these arguments are the following. So first of all, you have to provide the uh, class name, meaning the name under which your program, we will know 
and recognize this test. So if you debug your test, you will see the name of this class. The second argument is so-called pretty name. Uh, it's uh, a name under which you will um, issue our test and the name under which you will see the test name in your earlier front-end automation uh, page. Uh, the third argument that we need to provide is a combination of enums that specify what type of test we are creating. So um, these um, enums can be a combination, for example, of the test that is supposed to be run as a smoke test, meaning that it will run on every single uh, start of your editor or program. Or you can specify that this type of test is only meant to be run in the editor context, so it won't be accessible for you in the regular build. Okay, so once we have our macro, we have to implement the test logic. And as I said before, you have to implement the function called run test. So the argument parameters here is only accessible if you create the complex test. Those are the parameters that comes from the get test function. Uh, but if you would like to use some other parameters, you can always use the general command line and parse your arguments there. So in this uh, simple example, we simply get uh, the global work pointer and we use uh, another macro that encloses unit test underneath and we test if the pointer is not null. So underneath this macro uh, checks obviously the pointer and if the pointer is uh, null, it returns false. But you can always use uh, test equal, which is basically the same, but it doesn't lose the macro and it won't uh, include any return, returns that are not visible at the first sight. So we, if this passed, we simply return true and the test concludes. But obviously you can create more complex tests on your own. Uh, so pros of this approach is that it's fast and simple. It requires only basically two things for you to do. Mm, but on the other hand, if you'd like to do some costly operation like opening a level, well, it will stall your main thread. So if you're trying to do some performance measurements, it's not the best option. So to handle this, uh, we have something called automation latent commands. And automation latent commands also derive from the abstract class. And the reasoning behind creating those is to defer the test execution or, non, or to not block the main thread. Uh, similarly to the F automation test base, if it provides with common interface and it requires you to implement only single method called update. Uh, when you create or declare your command, you can declare a couple of parameters that will be usable in your update command. Uh, all of the latent commands can be queued in your run test functionality, and it basically will populate the QE of the commands, which then will be executed in the first and first out order. The execution of those commands is handled in a tick-like behavior, meaning that if the command was queued, we will hit the update method every single tick that the framework is ticking, and we will see if this command should be marked as concluded or we should re-enter the scope of the update function again in the, on the next tick. It's uh, quite a good choice for time-consuming operation of if you would like to, uh, I don't know, stall the execution of your test for a fixed amount of time. Maybe you are waiting for some, uh, I don't know, assets to be loaded or you don't want any artifacts being generated due to starting the test as soon as the map loads. So yeah, you can figure it out. Also, Unreal provides us with quite rich command library. Uh, there are um, commands specifically designed to be used in the editor. And also there are commands to be used specifically in the build, uh, build games. Yeah. So now, Let's talk a little bit how to create those commands. Uh, you can use a couple of macros. This uh, example shows us how to create um, engine latent automation command with no parameters. Uh, so 
it exports the engine API because in this example it is being um, declared in the engine module. And the first argument here, and the only one, is the name under which this command will be known to the program. So once you have this, you can go ahead and create your uh, command logic. So here, uh, as the name suggests, we are waiting for map to be loaded. So uh, as long as we return false from the call of this function, this means that this function is not completed yet and should be reiterated on the next stick of the framework. Once every condition is met, we simply return true and the execution flow goes to the next command in the queue. Keep in mind that you can run into some troubles like your command will never return true for some reason and yeah, you have to take care of it once you detect it, but it's quite difficult to spot. Also, we have availability for uh, declaring the commands with a couple of parameters and those parameters became a member variables of your uh, latent command body and you can use them in your update function. So we have a couple of more examples. Uh, here is the macro to define a local command, meaning the API won't be exported. And as you can see, there is a suffix one parameter here, uh, signifying that we are declaring the latent command with some parameters. So each parameter to be defined, need to, you need to provide the type of the variable, which in our example is the f name. And the second uh, argument to, to, uh, to declare a member variable is the variable name under which you will access it. We uh, at the PCF, because we created some library for our needs that will be used across the uh, other modules, we created an extension to this macro that exports API of your choice. So as you can see, it's a first argument here, and it simply defines what the API we are exporting. Uh, as stated previously, if you use your macro, all you have to do is to create your updated functionality. So how to use latent commands? Well, once you created them, there is a macro to queue them within your test logic. So as you can see, we simply use add latent automation command. And in this example, we are creating actually what I call a latent test because it employs latent commands. So here, uh, a part of the remaining test logic, which is not that important in our example, we simply instruct engine to wait fixed amount of time, meaning that the update function of this latent command will be hit on each iteration until we exceed wait time, which is two seconds. Then we simply issue an exec command, instructing the engine to set resolution to 640 by 480. Then we wait again, and then we restore the resolution, basically. Uh, so pros of this approach, we are not blocking main thread. And uh, if you dig a little bit deeper in the engine, you will discover that you can actually set a thread on which this command will run. On the cons, uh, yeah, the bugging tends to be cumbersome because, uh, well, you, you never know at which command you're actually at. So you would have to put a breakpoint in each of the update function body to know where you're actually at. So yeah, tracking the test progress might be a little bit difficult. Other tools that are uh, available to be used in um, the framework are uh, hardware accelerated video recording, as long as you, uh, what is called, uh, if you enable the plugin called pixel streaming in Windows, you will have access to a video recording. And on the consoles like PlayStation, they are working quite neatly. On the other hand, using Xbox is, uh, Limited to, limited to recording only like uh, six minutes of the playtime and you cannot do anything about it unless Microsoft change it, changes it. Also, you can issue GPUs, GPU traces. Uh, you can capture your screenshot and you can compare them. So if you have some assumption that the screenshot should look like this, you can always compare it and base the test results on it. So to determine test results, a couple of um, assumptions have to be met. So first of all, run tests have to return true. 
Second of all, no errors should be emitted during test execution, meaning from the beginning of the test till its end, we should not have any logging errors. However, if you're expecting some error, you can say so, and you can define so something called expected error. But it's a kind of a double-edged sword, because if you say, OK, I'm expecting one error on this test, and this error doesn't occur, you will mark your, the, the, the test will be marked as failed because something didn't go according to your plan. So yeah, I tend to not to use them. Uh, I would rather suggest you to ask somebody to fix the error rather than cover it up. So once we are done talking about how to write our test, let's talk how to run them actually. So the first option you have is using the uh, command line. So we have a couple of examples here. So the, your bread and butter would be using minus exec commands equals, and then we have a keyword called automation. And the uh, second argument here is run tests, which is always the same if you would like to run uh, one test. And then the third argument here is the pretty name under which your test is known. Like you created it as a second argument of your macro. If you'd like to run a couple of tests in a batch in the single run, then you will concatenate with, with a plus sign. If you would like to run all tests that were declared and implemented in your project, then you would use run all. If you would like to employ running tests in the batches filtered by a enum, which was the third argument in your macro, you can use it with the keyword run filter. And then you would have to use the filter that we would like to run. Those filters are available in the source code, so I'm not including this, those here because you can easily look it up. Uh, there's also a HAPA function that will list you all the tests that have been implemented in uh, your project if you would like to have a list to look at. Also, en uh, Unreal Engine provides you with the test results visible in the log, but they are not. Uh, that well visible, I mean, it's only a logging, so you have to look through your log and see, okay, this test was marked as successful, this test was marked as failed. Um, yeah, you can also put those commands directly in your running program, and it will execute the test immediately, as long as it was found. Keep in mind that there are no support to uh, at specific arguments unless you started your program with the command line already put in. There's uh, some other options to run the test. If you open something called session frontend in your tools running the editor, there is a tab called automation. And uh, as you can see, it has quite intuitive interface. Uh, we have a search box. We have a filter box. The results are much more clear because we have uh, coloring. So green means good, usually red means bad. And there is no support for command line arguments. And it only shows are the tests that were marked as usable in editor context. So only those tests can be run this way. So this concludes the part about the C++ part of the test that we have. But we said that uh, automated tests require something called um, automated uh, automation tool, like the tool that will drive the test execution. So this tool is called Gauntlet in Unreal. It is actually a framework that uh, is part of your Unreal automation tool. Uh, it is written in C Sharp, as most of the scripts in the Unreal, and it's capable of preparing your test environment based on the commands that you provided it with. It is also capable of running multiple instances of tests on one or multiple machines. So let's say you want to run three tests at once on your machine. You are free to do so as long as you specify it in your script. It's qu it has quite uh, useful uh, functionalities to handle consoles. Uh, let's say your PlayStation 5 or 4 or Xbox is not responding. Gauntlet will detect it, and it will reboot your console for you. 
It is also capable of updating operating system or install builds. Moreover, it can access hard drive of uh, your console and gather any artifacts that were created during test execution. It's obviously provi uh, providing a way to forward your arguments to the Unreal Engine, so it knows how to instruct the engine to issue a test. Uh, it, it, it can monitor responsiveness of your process, so if for some reason your engine got frozen, a gauntlet will detect it that the heartbeat wasn't issued and will probably mark the test as failed and kill the process. It is also capable of creating test results. Uh, it is based on parsing the logs and if any crash or entry occurs, Gauntlet will neatly cut the uh, call stack from the crash and put it in your report. Also, obviously, as it can parse the log, it can determine if the test was failed or passed. Um, so Gauntlet is quite daunting to be uh, used, actually. At the first sign, uh, say, site, it looks very complicated, and the documentation is talking about uh, high-level structure. It's not talking about the code itself. So to be honest, it took me a little while to get a hold on it. But once you do, it turns out that you don't need that much to run it. So actually, what you need to run any test, uh, assuming it's not the editor, uh, you have to provide the absolute path to the build. Uh, second of all, you have to specify what type of platform and configuration you would like to run your test against. Third of all, you have to specify a project name that you would like to test. Optionally, Gauntlet have a couple of useful parameters, like, for instance, you can specify the target console you would like to test, but if you fail to do so, Gauntlet will choose the default console uh, chosen by your uh, work environment. Um, from uh, apart, among the examples, like you can specify that if you are running on Windows, I want to run test in windowed mode. I can set resolution. I can instruct that I don't need re rendering. I can set max duration, meaning that if the test took longer than some fixed amount of time, we'll mark test as failed. There are much more of those, and they are easily to be extended. You just simply look at the code and copy the same, they, they, you don't need to add any parsing functionality, they, they will work straight ahead, out of the box. Okay, so now you can learn on our mistakes, or our experience. Uh, so we started development of the test quite late in our um, develop, development cycle, and we didn't really know what we were doing back then, but it helped us to develop some useful things that I hope you will find useful. So our first idea was to create something called level transition test. And the idea was that the test will teleport the player from one level to another and check if this travel was successful. Well, with time, it grew to quite complicated tests, and it beat us quite badly in the end, because, uh, well, it was failing almost constantly, and uh, yeah, it, it was too complex to be run as simple test. Moreover, we wanted for people that are not able to program to write tests as well, and for that we created our custom Blueprint API, that was mainly used by our Dave QA team. We decided to test uh, to send test results in the mail, but it wasn't the best idea, and I will show you why in a moment. We also stored the artifacts that were stored uh, that were uh, created during the test execution on our network drives, and it also wasn't the best idea because let's assume that you would like to actually check some screenshot, then you have to open like the screenshot viewer. If you want to view stats, you have to open another program. You have to like see, look for those files in the 
whole tree of the folder, so it's cumbersome to use. We did create some custom graphs leveraging Grafana, and uh, back then we used Influx database because it was the thing that we had, but it was not optimal for the type of data we, that we were trying to store. Uh, because Gantlet was not available at the time, we had to write our custom scripts to handle consoles, and we used those to issue um, tests from the Jenkins. So, yeah, here's the example of simple test. Uh, it's not that simple as you can see. Uh, it has couples of assumptions like sometimes you have to wait for cinematics, sometimes you don't have to. There are also we have to track the progress of the test, which uh, we, we had an idea that, we'll, okay, the test is crashing sometimes, so let's create a, a crash recovery system. And yeah, it was getting out of our hand to support this kind of test. So rule of a thumb, make your test as simple as possible, rather test like a small chunk of functionality rather than test the whole game in simple tests because, well, you will have troubles uh, to understand if the test should be marked as passed and failed. So if you have like 30 transitions here and one of them fails, so what would you call this test? Is it passed or is it failed? Is it partially passed? Like, I think you get the idea. Here we can see, uh, for instance, the graph, which is took from the Grafana. So we, we took those graphs and we put those in the mails. But uh, the issue of this approach is that there is no tooltip, so you cannot hover over the points of the graph. So you can only like maybe take your measurement and put it in your monitor and try to figure out, okay, is it like 85 or 84? And uh, another issue of that, if you are not on the mailing list when this test report came, well, you can never get it. <laughs> so you have to ask somebody, hey, hey man, do you know the test report from change list number 621770 on Windows development on this test? Can you forward me it? Yeah, so it's, it's not ideal. So we opted to move away from this approach. Yeah, so here are a couple of the experiences that we have. I think I explained a couple of those, but let's double check. Yeah, so first of all, write simple tests, uh, which can be easily understood if it failed or it is succeeded. Uh, maybe don't use mm, your mailing inbox to store the test results, because as I said before, it's hard to be shared within the company. Also, uh, very big um, topic. It probably needs uh, another presentation for it. How to create the test results and visualize, vi visualize them in the manner that it's easy to understand to anybody. It's really hard to achieve. We also didn't have any test history apart from the mailing list, and there were no testing trends. We also use our environment that we had at the time, and we didn't think it through because, well, we started from creating the test, but we didn't think how we will store the data. So, yeah, we had to think how the, we actually store the media and how we, like, index them. Also, the question that emerged, well, who should write the tests? Mm, well, if you ask me, everybody should write them. <laughs> so uh, let's say we have a developer that is working on some kind of feature of his or her. Uh, well, probably he's the most uh, qualified person to do test cases for it. So rule of a thumb would be to, uh, before you submit your code, like ask developer to create the test for his feature. And uh, yeah, also uh, our dev QA is quite keen to use automated tests as well. And probably they are the most qualified people to test the game. So why not let them? Also, when the test should be written, definitely not on the end of your development. You have to start as soon as possible. 
So a couple of solutions from our side. We had to think through where we are going to store the data. We wanted uh, the data to be easily be, to be tracked. We wanted to have some trends. We wanted to be able to search the test by, uh, I don't know, the platform, the name, whatever. Also, we had to think through how we will stock the logs, the media, the stats. We wanted to have some custom graphs to visualize the taste data. And we wanted it to be accessible through the web page, so you wouldn't need any third party uh, software. We, we decided to keep mails, but the mails will be only used for notifying, like, hey man, your testing badge is ready, here are the results. Uh, if you would like to check them, here's the link for you. We also modified a little bit functional testing because by the nature of those, uh, those, are, those are bound to the map that they are placed on. So we got rid of this uh, limitation. So now you can create your test logic that can be used on any content, as long as this content is viable to be used with this type of test. That allows to, ac uh, to access, um, expand the number of developers that we are able to write the test, meaning our dev QA. Apart from that, we really thought through about uh, how to create the um, test visualization. So to do that, before we even start to write tests, we think first think how we would like to see the data. To do that, we created some custom API that is uh, usable in C++ and Blueprints. It's directly affecting data aggregation, and it's quite easy to extend uh, because <laughs> how it was implemented. <laughs> Uh, it's also um, not uh, that heavy to be used because it's uh, not stalling the game thread. It will be used uh, on the thread pool. So yeah, you can use them and they won't affect the performance. We also wanted to improve the gauntlet a little bit. So uh, we adapted it to our infrastructure. So you don't have to provide the uh, path to the build. You just provide the change list, uh, platform and Gantlet will figure it out. We'll, it will look for the build in our network drive. Uh, we use Gantlet also as a glue that will connect the Unreal Engine with our databases. And we also did some extension to UE Automation Framework, meaning the C++ side. So we changed a little bit approach of writing the test and we created a class that will actually have the F Automation test base which will be your test logic. And it splits the logic of the test in a couple of steps. So a uh, couple of those are optional. So there is a function called initialize that you don't have to implement if your test is really simple. But if it does, it's separating the initialization logic into other function. So it's easier for you to debug. Also, you can choose between the latent test and the instant one. So you can see what type of test you are looking at. So you know where to look for the, uh, for the issues, you know how to debug it. Because as I said, latent commands are quite difficult to be debugged. Finally, we have instant test, uh, oh sorry. We have two latent, latent commands which will be used by your latent test. We have instant test, which will be used by your instant test. And we have optional finish test, will will wrap up your test maybe uh, summarize uh, or clean up after the test. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So we expanded the macro a little bit. So here basically you can see the replication of the logic. Like we always call the initialize first. If the initialization failed, then the test should be marked as failed instantly. However, if it passed, we'll either queue latent commands in our latent, uh, latent test, or we will just uh, do instant test uh, in case of the instant one. Finally, we are uh, using wrap up, meaning finishing the test up. Uh, yeah, the, the advantage of this approach is also that in the regular F automation test base, well, you cannot use uh, 
uh, inheritance, but in this approach, you can actually create your testing class, and you can add some member variables there, and you can reuse it with the another test. Yeah, so uh, here's the pipeline that we use at PCF currently. So we use Jenkins as our continuous integration system that builds, this builds for us. And we uh, are going to use Jenkins as a, um, as a way to trigger Gauntlet and instruct it to run for te some tests for us. So as you can see, Gauntlet starts the Unreal Engine off, uh, with the command line that we've chosen, meaning instructing it to run some tests. And then Gauntlet analyzes test results. It gathers all the artifacts from uh, the console, the Windows, whatever. And then it realizes to appropriate database. So we use Grafana Locky plugin to store the logs. And we use Google Drive to store all the heavy data, like videos and screenshots. And we store all the other data in PostgreSQL. With the Google Drive, we first upload the data to the Google Drive, and then we substitute the paths to the media in our Postgres database. All of this data is accessible to us in Grafana, which we use as our test results frontend. So here you can see uh, the test list site on our Grafana. And I think the important part is the top table because uh, you can choose actually and filter the test by your needs. So if you want to see the test from specific change list, you will just check it and it will filter it out for you. Also, you have uh, like staring at you in famous blue, uh, red and green, sorry. And yeah, as you can see, green signifies the test is good to go and fail health means, and the red means that the test is failed. So the description here states that if you click on the test ID, you can go to the test results page dedicated for this result. So if you do so, we have something like this. Um, the top table is um, Grafana Locky. So it stores the lock with the actual times uh, when the lock was issued. And you can either read it from top to bottom or you can reverse it. It's your choice. Actually, we are seeing here the end of the test. Um, yeah, and on the bottom left side, we have um, our custom-made graph that replicates the um, data that we gathered during the test. And this graph is actually interactive, so you can click on it. You can zoom it out, I guess. And you have a tooltip, so now you are know what you are looking at, actually. Uh, the place on the bottom right side is the place for your screenshot. So the API was designed in this way, that if, uh, if you do grab a screenshot during the test execution, actually, if you hit S, it will show you a screenshot. So you can see, for instance, a spike on your uh, graph of your performance graph, seeing that, um, I don't know, the RHII thread is really high. So you hit S and you can see what's going on on your screen. We are also planning to uh, synchronize this graph with the video. So the idea is that once you hit play, it will follow the graph and it will play back the video for you so you can see at every single time what's going on on the screen. So yeah. You don't have to guess what's happening. Yeah, and that wraps up. And I would like to help everybody involved to this project because it took a couple of years to get to it. So Kamil Spavitsky is our tools programmer, tools lead programmer. We have Namian Bruzjak, which is our build engineer. We have Stanisław Miszczenko. Uh, Kamil Homernik, Jarosław Zorowiec, Bożeń Domański, Dorota Rutkowska, production team, engine team, dev QA team, and anyone involved at PCF. So thank you guys if you're looking at it. <laughs>
Uh, so obviously, if you have any questions, now is the time. If we don't have much time left, you can always ping me later. So. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, how do you separate your uh, code assets, uh, your, your test code and assets from the, produ from the production? For example, if you use some sort of automated performance tests, do you set up something on the level you want to test or something like that? Do you prevent from some errors, you know, from putting this stuff to shipping build or something else? Uh, I'm not sure that I'm getting your question right, but um, are you asking if we do put some debug data on the levels to, to uh, grab performance? Or? I, I wanted to ask if there are some situations when you want to test some production stuff, like, uh, for example, is the performance test. You want to test a map. You do... Uh, <laughs> Wait a second, I need to keep my uh, things together. Uh, so, so may maybe I just uh, say about context because I have uh, some my personal problem in my project because uh, I'm trying to develop some performance test for our project and I have a problem with setup with um, with so we've set up this is because we don't want to uh, <laughs> in other hand, I need to put some my de my deb my debug actors on level we want to um, test, but I'm not sure how to prevent situations to uh, keep this data be be before. So it's not interfering with your performance, right? Yeah. Well, the idea is that we, like, I guess we put markers on the level, and those markers are really lightweight, and they are not affecting performance at any point. We simply spawn our camera there and we can like direct it in the direction and it's not affecting performance actually in this way. The other approach would be to probably pre-record the camera movement and just drive the camera through the level and gather your performance. But uh, I'm not sure I like, it shouldn't affect performance as well. No, no, I just fucked my question. <laughs> this, this is the problem with English. I just, I try, I try to catch you up after. <laughs> sure. Uh, hey, so you mentioned that you started testing pretty late and I wanted to ask you like how much uh, did you have to refactor your code to make testing available? And uh, a follow-up question. Um, did you learn that some stuff in Unreal cannot be tested automatically? Or, okay, they probably can be tested, but you have to uh, put a lot of effort, so it's not worth, and you decided to test it manually. Um, or um, maybe it's a matter of approach, and if you like uh, know um, before uh, implementing stuff how to approach them, testing is actually possible without much effort. Okay, uh, so first question, uh, can you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah, uh, first question is uh, oh, how okay, much stuff did you code, have to yeah. refactor? So yeah, we actually we just had to put it all into the bin after the first iteration because it was, the, our assumption was were wrong. So we had to like put the code into the bin, but we keep the experience in our head and we created the new API. And we, for example, we completely abandoned uh, uh, our own Blueprint API and we reused the functional testing. We just made it accessible uh, to follow the rule, like don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, so yeah, shortly, yeah, we had to refactor completely everything. Uh, the second question, like it's always the matter of time because my approach is like everything is doable if you can, if you have time to spend. So there are some things that are not worth automating because uh, 
you, you, you could probably create a solution for it, but it will take so much, on so much amount of time that it's not worth it. So every single, um, every single case should be discussed probably with, uh, with your QA. And you, know, you, you can always discuss like, hey man, I can do it, but it will take like half year of, of my work. I think it's not worth it. Like how often are you doing this test case? Maybe it's uh, like it's faster for human to do it. So yeah, also the reason uh, the role of a thumb is don't try to automate everything. Not everything can, can be automated. For instance, like we tried to automate testing of the breakpoints in blueprints, and we found out that yeah, actually Epix uh, commented out like we cannot do it because in the breakpoint there is no ticking, so we can do we cannot do it. So short answer: don't try to automate everything. Uh, see every case as a separate scenario, discuss it, and yeah, think if it's worth it. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's not. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, so uh, at People Can Fly, you have quite some experience with uh, multiplayer games. Did you try to approach this subject of multiplayer? tests or functional tests or any kind of multiplayer tests? Uh, well, yeah, we, we do have uh, some tests in, uh, um, like in development that are aiming to be testing online functionalities. So uh, yeah, the, the way we work is we try to address our current needs. So if the project is using multiplayer functionality, and it would like to have some online testing, we say, okay, let's do it. So yeah, we do so. We do those as well. Does it answer your question? Uh, well, uh, it, it's, it's good to know you, you're thinking about it. You didn't tell too many details. I'd be curious, so maybe I can reach out to you afterwards. Yeah, because I, I'm not sure how much I can tell you actually, because it's, it, <laughs> It's uh, a little bit about the project themselves. So yeah, you can uh, write to me. I will check out how much I can tell you, OK? <laughs> Fair enough. Thanks. Well, I've seen that you have quite extensive backend with, uh, uh, and, and tools for gathering the data, emails, uh, databases. And that's cool for a big studio. Do you have any advice how to approach all of that with, uh, for, for a smaller studio that has like 10 people, or is it even worth it? Uh, well, you can always use mailing, but uh, mm -hmm. like if you have only 10 people, probability that we will lose some reports is quite small. So maybe you can do that. Like you can simply write scripts in your gauntlet that will create a, will forward the um, report from gauntlet to all of your people and it should solve it. Like you'll have the information and you, if you like, a, you are a small studio, you don't need a extensive database for five or seven projects. I should, I think it's, it should be sufficient. So just stick with the, with the gauntlet, right? Yeah, I it think should it enough. should be enough. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Okay. I think I don't see any more questions. So, like, just remember, we are hiring. So, if anybody is interested in automated testing or any other aspect of the game development, let us know. And always, you can find me on LinkedIn. And if you have any question that emerge after this talk, write to me. I will try to respond to you. So. Thanks, guys.